Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. I frequently get asked, when are you and Briefcase going to collaborate again? Well wait no longer because I am delighted to tell you that the brilliant Briefcase is narrating today's video which has been written by The Crime Reel. Without further delay, in today's case, Briefcase will be looking at the lives of Bonnie Jean Garland and Richard Herring. Over to you Briefcase. Richard Herring was born in Los Angeles on the 16th of December 1953 to an unmarried Mexican mother and an Irish father. His father was an alcoholic who abandoned his family before Richard was three years old. Richard had a difficult childhood, but despite the odds being stacked against him, he excelled at school. He was valedictorian of his class at the Abraham Lincoln High School in Los Angeles and was reported to have an IQ of well over 130. He was known for working hard and was described by one of his teachers as one of the most fantastic students that they had taught during their career. Richard received multiple scholarship offers from several top universities and eventually decided to attend Yale. Starting in 1971, on a full tuition and expense package. His life at Yale was completely at odds with his upbringing in Los Angeles, and he initially struggled to fit in and make new friends. Despite previously being a straight A student, his grades began to suffer somewhat, and the opportunity presented by this Ivy League university was not all that he had hoped it would be. However, things dramatically improved for Richard when in the autumn of 1974, he met a 17-year-old undergraduate by the name of Bonnie Garland. Bonnie's start in life could not have been more different to Richard's. Born in 1957, she was the eldest of four children, born to Paul and Joan Garland. Paul was a wealthy international lawyer, and Bonnie spent the majority of her childhood living in Brazil. When Bonnie was 14 years old, the family returned to the US, where they lived in a large house in an upmarket area of Scarsdale in New York. She was enrolled in the exclusive Madeira School in Virginia, from where she graduated in 1974. Bonnie was very intelligent, spoke multiple languages, as well as being a talented musician, and she was able to secure a place to study music at Yale. Within weeks of her starting at the university, she met Richard, and the pair soon began dating. It was both Bonnie and Richard's first serious relationship. Despite his grades being lower than expected, Richard still graduated in 1975 with a degree in geology and geophysics. In the autumn of that year, he started a master's degree at the Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. The pair remained committed and threw themselves into a long distance relationship, writing numerous letters and chatting for hours at a time on the telephone. Bonnie embarked upon an accelerated study program in the hope that she would be able to graduate earlier than planned. And by Christmas of 1976, Richard and Bonnie were visiting grad schools in the hope that they could continue their education in the same location. However, Bonnie's grades were also beginning to suffer and her parents were becoming increasingly concerned at her deteriorating mood and stress levels. Richard had never particularly ingratiated himself with her parents and they remained convinced that he was not good for their daughter. Bonnie and Richard began growing apart and cracks in their relationship began to appear. Richard, who was four years older than Bonnie, wanted them to settle down, get married and have a family, whilst Bonnie, who was only 20 at the time, was not ready for any of this. Bonnie failed to achieve the necessary grades to graduate in the spring of 1977, so would be attending summer school that year. Prior to this, she embarked upon a six-week tour of Europe with the Yale Glee Club, and it was during this time she became increasingly close to another man. By the time she returned home in early July, she knew that she no longer wanted to be with Richard. Her parents were relieved that she had decided to end the relationship and also that she appeared to be back to her old, happy self. With Richard in Texas, Bonnie explained her feelings to him on the telephone. Richard begged her to reconsider and convinced her to allow him one last visit. He arrived in Scarsdale on the 6th of July, 1977. 
The couple spent a long day in intense discussions about their relationship, but Bonnie's mind was made up. Richard slept in the family's guest room and was scheduled to fly back to Texas the following day. Bonnie was exhausted and soon fell asleep. However, Richard struggled to do the same. Flicking through the pages of a magazine, he decided that the only way to resolve the situation was to kill Bonnie and then kill himself. At around 2am, while Bonnie, her parents and three young siblings, 18-year-old Patrick, 15-year-old John and 13-year-old Kathy were asleep in their home, Richard went down to the basement and selected a claw hammer which he hid under a yellow towel. He walked up the two flights of stairs to Bonnie's bedroom, left the hammer wrapped in a towel outside her door and went to check that she was asleep. Once he had confirmed that she was peacefully sleeping, he retrieved the hammer and brutally attacked Bonnie around the head. Richard then took one of the family's cars and considered, but then rejected the idea of driving it off a cliff. After driving around for several hours, he ended up at St Mary's Church in Koksaki. Richard went into the church, still wearing his bloodstained clothes, and said to the priest, I have just killed my girlfriend. The priest immediately called the Scarsdale police to tell them what he had been told. At around 7am on the 7th of July, Bonnie's father Paul left for work as usual. About an hour later, her mother Joan answered a knock at the front door. She was surprised to see the police standing on her doorstep. They asked if Bonnie lived there and whether she was okay. Joan rushed upstairs and found her eldest daughter lying on the bed, suffering from horrific injuries. Bonnie was still breathing. She had been lying alone and terrified for around six hours. Bonnie was rushed to hospital and straight into surgery, but her injuries were too severe and the surgeons were unable to save her. She died at 10.38 p.m. that evening. Richard never denied the crime and was charged with second degree murder. The events which followed were later described by the Garland family as a second assault. Around a week after their daughter's murder, people began to take pity on Richard, believing that his difficult upbringing made him a victim too. They started to rally around and offer support. Richard's former university roommate gathered letters from supporters, both from Los Angeles and Yale. They detailed Richard's so-called good character and were to be used in a campaign to obtain bail. This, together with the support of the Christian Brothers Community of Albany, who were to provide shelter and supervision prior to the trial, allowed Richard's lawyers to compile a bail application. Bail was set at $50,000. The bail amount was met, predominantly by a paediatrician at Yale, who had never met Richard prior to his crime, but nonetheless put her house up as collateral. On the 11th of August 1977, Richard was released pending his trial and was able to live as a free man, attending classes at the State University of New York under an alias. Richard's supporters continued to argue that his lonely, frightened childhood and subsequent fear of abandonment had been the cause of his violence. Supporters raised money to retain a top New York defense attorney, Jack Littman, who agreed to defend Richard for a very low fee because he felt the case was an obvious human tragedy. The highly publicized trial began in Westchester County Courthouse in White Plains on the 15th of May, 1978. Richard was charged with second degree murder. His defense argued that his childhood and fear of being abandoned had caused extreme emotional disturbance and he was temporarily insane when Bonnie had told him that she wanted to end the relationship. They also called into question Bonnie's character for becoming close to another man during her trip to Europe. On the 18th of June, 1978, Richard was found not guilty of second degree murder, instead being found guilty of first degree manslaughter. The following month, he was sentenced to the maximum penalty under the law for a manslaughter conviction, eight to 25 years. He became eligible for parole in 1986. He was eventually released on the 12th of January 1995 
after serving 17 years in the Wende Correctional Facility in Alden, New York. After his release, he moved to New Mexico, where he was hired by a state-funded mental health program designed to keep the community safe. Bonnie's parents were appalled that Richard's impoverished background gained him more sympathy than their daughter got in death and firmly believe that he got away with murder. I'd like to thank the Crime Reel for giving me this opportunity to read on his channel. My channel is called Briefcase and I predominantly do older crime stories. If any of you would like to visit my channel, you'd be most welcome and there's a link below. That concludes today's story. As always, please leave any comments down below as I will be interested in reading them as usual. Many thanks to Briefcase for narrating today's case. For those of you interested, I do have a playlist set up for collaborations. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Brief cat has been sleeping next to me during this entire recording. Goodbye.